Hey, good morning. It is, uh, it's great to see everyone and young people who are typically in the back. Uh, really good to see you here today. Today is one of our uh, what we call Family Sundays, and uh, we're actually going to be a little bit more strategic uh, throughout 2020 uh, in having actually more Family Sundays, um, and uh, we're going to embrace the wiggles and, and embrace the fidgeting and different things like that, but we want to encourage and train kids to be part of sometimes what we call Big C Church, but to be part of, of, uh, of what we do uh, in here and be part of the larger body body. Uh, of the church. So it's interesting that um, with just um, a, a split second, basically, at 11.59 on, on Tuesday evening, we will move into saying goodbye to one decade and hello to another decade. And I don't know about y'all, but saying 2020 seems so surreal. In fact, uh, I was thinking about that uh, this week. Uh, yeah, I, I, in, in May of, of this coming year, I will officially be out of high school 30 years. And, and I, when I was thinking about that, I was thinking, you know, uh, back in 1990, thinking 30 years into the future, it seems so far away. Now it doesn't seem that long ago. It just, it, it seems like yesterday. And, 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 and we have had a lot of changes. And, and in fact, over the last decade, um, we have seen some things kind of progress in, in a pretty amazing way. Um, 9-11 is a generation ago. Think about that. That is a, is a full generation ago that we're going to have kids that are graduating high school that don't know a world pre-9-11. We have a, 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 a group uh, of young people growing up today that will never know a world without Facebook, I mean, think about that. In fact, they will learn in history class one day about this thing called dial-up. <laughs> Y'all remember dial-up? You remember, you know, AOL and the, you know, that sort of noise? They will never know that. They will never know a world that doesn't have high-speed internet and, and just digital uh, information that is a constant ass. I mean, I, I used to kind of laugh that my kids grew up in a world that uh, they never knew world without chicken McNuggets. I, mean, I, I that was that was something that came kind of when I was like a teenager and, and so on. And in fact, you know, here's the, here's the joke: What do you hear somebody never say after eating a chicken McNugget? Tastes like chicken. <laughs> that one's free, by the way. I mean, and, and we think about the technological advances. I mean, today we have doorbells that have cameras and. Uh, there's, there's all this kind of stuff. In fact, the other day I, I, I was leaving the house and I got uh, about a mile away from the house and I reached for my phone and realized I didn't have my phone and oh, what am I going to do? So I pulled out my watch <laughs> and I called my wife and said, hey, by the way, I don't have my phone with me. I kind of do. It's right here but I can't hear very well because I don't have my ear pods with me, and so on. So we have all these different changes. Now, I, but I think about that. When I was a kid, I used to envision a world that was a whole lot like this right here. Uh, remember the Jetsons? We envisioned a, a future where there's flying cars and so on, but things are a whole lot smarter. In fact, I was at, I think I was at Lowe's the other day, and I was kind of shopping around, and they had um, outlets that you could plug in that then you plug in your lamp or whatever that are Alexa enabled, or like what we want to call wiretap en en enabled. I mean, they're listening to us all the time. So the world is a whole lot smarter, a whole lot more connected, and a whole lot uh, more developed than it was 10 years ago. But let me just talk a little bit about some big things that happened over the last decade that I think we could kind of point to and say, here's hey, something true that maybe wasn't true a decade ago. I, I think. Um, our nation is more politically divided than when we were, we were 10 years ago. And, and I also look at that as far as the culture war, and I think it's high time that the church quit fighting the culture war and just worry about getting people to Jesus. Um, but with this culture war, there are those that hold traditional values and those that hold secular values and there's a warring that is happening and a, and a greater division that, is, that we've ever seen uh, in our nation. Uh, I, I think the gospel has become more offensive to people. Believe it or not, the idea of, uh, of one way to heaven, uh, the idea of, 
uh, of, a, of a moral compass that comes with knowing Jesus. All of these things uh, are becoming more and more offensive in, in our culture today. Um, in fact, I'll even tell you just a couple of things that are true today that I, I would not have envisioned 10 years ago. Uh, what is true today uh, is that there's, there's what's called the rise of the nuns. And rise of the nuns uh, is kind of in, in, in the ministry world are, are people with no religious affiliation whatsoever. It used to be that it was, you know, the committed Christians, but even those that were kind of over here and not, not secular humanists, they were kind of in the middle, that they would identify themselves as Christian because they grew up going to Sunday school and they went to church a couple times a year and so on like that. Basically, nominalism is dying in America, where you have committed Christians over here and where it used to be this area of nominal Christians, they're going away. And most of them are gravitating toward that idea of I have no religious affiliation whatsoever. And, and so that is a major shift over the last little uh, last uh, few years. Also, uh, uh, one of the things that I call as a major shift, church attendance patterns have changed over the last decade. In fact, they have changed drastically over the last decade. That uh, people, even who are committed Christians, love Jesus sold out on Jesus, attend church less. And a lot of that is our mobility as a culture. It's not unusual for somebody to get a good plain deal on Thursday for Friday evening and say, hey, let's go to whatever, or go to the lake. And, and, and there's a lot more activities they're having on the weekends and so on. They're pulling people away from church attendance. And I think, you know, I look at our church right now, uh, now today because of weather and because of after Christmas and so on like that will not be the case. But we usually have over 700 people here. And, and the reality is, um, on, on all of that, if this were 10 or 15 years ago, our church of 700 would probably be a church of 1,000 or more. And that's how much things have shifted and changed through the years. And so that's true the last decade. And I think, what, what will it look like in, in, in the coming decade? I, I think political division will continue. I think political division, I think the, the cultural war will, will continue. I think we're going to see an erosion of, of religious liberty in our nation. Uh, it's, uh, I think if I'm preaching 10 years from now and I'm sitting up here, I'll probably be telling you, however, the last decade, we've seen an erosion of, uh, uh, of religious uh, freedom in, in, our, in our nation. But I also think the gospel is going to continue to be offensive. The people will be offended by the truth. In fact, they'll be offended by saying, you need a Savior. I mean, what do I need saved from? Because there's nothing wrong with me. But here's what I do know is true. I know that over the next decade, people will still be broken, and people will still need Jesus. And in needing Jesus and, and being broken, the role of the local church will be vital in communities all throughout our nation. And in fact, the role of the local church, it may shift, but it will still be needed. So today, I, I wanna do something. I wanna look at a passage of scripture that I think is vital for the church. And this passage of scripture is actually Luke chapter five. And if you have your Bibles, you can go ahead and turn there. If you have your phones, because we live in a different world than we were 10 years ago, I assume that today, unlike 10 years ago, that people are going to be on their phones reading the Bible more so than carrying a Bible to church. But also, if you don't have a Bible, there's, there's Bibles in the seats in front of you, and that's page 860. And if you don't have a Bible um, at home, you're more than welcome to take one of ours, uh, use it for your very own, mark it up, uh, write your name in it, and so on like that. This particular passage in Luke chapter 5 is the first passage that I actually preached 18 and a half years ago at Valley View Christian Church. And we were meeting in, in there in what is our gathering area, but this is a, what I consider a very profound passage for us as we, as we follow Jesus. And it's a familiar one. I, I know growing up in the basement of, of, of Buckland Christian Church in Buckland, Kansas, this was a mainstay uh, sort of story but a, a vital one at that. So let's go ahead and, and begin. It says, on one occasion, while the crowd was pressing in on him, him is Jesus, to hear the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Gisenerat, and he saw two boats by the lake, but the fishermen 
had gone out of them and were washing their nets. Getting into one of the boats, which was Simon's, he asked uh, him to, to put out a little from the land, and he sat down and taught people from the boat. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we toiled all night and took nothing. In other words, it's the end of the day. We didn't have a good day. We want to go home. And then he goes on and says, but at your word, I will let down the nets. And when they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish, and their nets were breaking. They signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them, and they came and filled both boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord." For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish that they had taken. And also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners of Simon. Now, here's something that uh, I just want to share with you. Um, actually, if you had ever wanted to do a study of, uh, of the word astonished or amazed, depending on the, the translation that you're using, you could go on to a place called BibleGateway.com. And you could type in the word amazed or astonished or surprised, whatever, and, and see the number of times people were amazed at Jesus. It's pretty remarkable to see the number of times that, that the people were just dumbfounded at what Jesus was able to do. And this is actually one of those. But then it goes on to say, and Jesus said to Simon, do not be afraid. From now on, you will be catching men. And when they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. It's kind of a familiar passage. It's kind of one of those uh, big stories of the New Testament that you've probably heard a lot of preachers preach throughout the years. And I know I've preached it several times because I just love this passage. But the reality is there's, there's something that if we're not careful, we're going to miss it. We're going to miss a, a, what I'm going to call a cultural norm of 2,000 years ago for Jewish people that may not be the case today. But 2,000 years ago, Jewish people had what I'll call a healthy fear of the water. They were not seafaring people. Uh, they were land people. And even those that were, were fishermen and, and they fished for a living, they tended to stay on the, the kind of close to the shore. And one of the reasons why they stayed close to the shore is it was safer. Because you go out in deep water, the, the waves are, are bigger, there's a greater chance of capsizing, there's a greater chance uh, of drowning. So what they would do is they would, they would drift on kind of the, the shoreline to do the fishing. But Jesus says, cast out into the deep. And the deep represented risk. And the, the deep represented discomfort. And deep was, was a place that they didn't really want to go because there is, there's a, a lot of danger there. And so Peter kind of says, listen, listen, guy, I, I fished all night and caught nothing. And, and, but, but since you say so, and since you have, have, have told me to do this, I'm going to do this. Now, I don't know if there was obedience or I'll show you going on here. But he cast out, and as he cast out into the deep, it says that the nets filled up, that they began to break, another boat came on, and, and the, the boats began to sink because there were so many fish. Now here's the beautiful thing that sometimes we, we miss as far as what Jesus is, is doing. Jesus is drawing them out of their comfort zone. He's bringing them to a place that's unsafe. He's bringing them to a place of risk. He's bringing them to a place of discomfort. But yet we understand that there's, there's, there's great things that happen here. So I'm going to ask you this question. Are you a person that is drawn to comfort? And as we do that here today, go ahead and watch this. Do you like your comfort? I think all of us, if we were very honest, would say we, we like our comfort. In fact, uh, um, I, I actually preached this passage a few months ago out in Gallup uh, while I was talking with the church there, and we're actually transitioning to where 
Uh, they're going to be using our video and some of our methods of doing church and different things like that. But a man walked up to me after the service and he said these words, I don't just like comfort, I'm addicted to comfort. And I, I, I think about that because the, the reality is everyone likes comfort. I love comfort. When I get home from church uh, this evening and after fourth service and, and different things like that, uh, I'm going to put on my home pants. And y'all have probably heard me talk about home pants before. If you're not, I'm just going to tell you home pants are not public pants. They're not Walmart pants. Not everybody in Edgewood has got that figured out. But the reality is home pants are just comfortable, right? And, and the reason why we, we love to lounge around in them, and, and, and I, there's been an, an accusation, and I'll just tell you today that's not true, but there's an accusation that I like to wear flannel shirts. <laughs> now with that, I, I will just tell you, I've got a closet full of them, and, and one of the reasons why I love flannel so much is they're, they're so daggone comfortable, Right? Uh, I just, it just like, I love, in fact, my favorite time of year is what I call flannel season. They're just very comfortable. So we love comfort, right? And and I can tell that people love comfort. Uh, I can actually see that on a Sunday morning because people have a routine. They have a service that they go to. That's the one that they're comfortable with. Also, I'm just going to throw this out. Uh, There's a fair number of you that if you don't sit where you normally sit, it throws me off. Because <laughs> I'm supposed to be able to look over there, and there they are, and not over there, right? And it's actually funny to watch a husband and wife come in separately, and like one of them, like especially second service, which is really full, they end up not sitting where they're supposed to be. They, find, they, they sit where they can find a, a seat, and then the other spouse comes in, and they immediately turn the direction that they're supposed to go because that's a routine and and we're very comfortable in that routine in fact what we're going to do here in a couple weeks actually two weeks from today we're starting a series called the one thing that changes everything and in the one thing that changes everything we're going to talk about how to develop a routine of study of scripture in in our personal lives and, and and how to develop a comfort level of, of being in God's Word on a daily basis to allow God to, to change us uh, in a very profound way. And so the reality is many of us, whether it be routine, whether it be clothes, whether it be our chair at our house, the temperature level, uh, who we like to hang out with, we love our comfort. But at the opposite end of that, because we love comfort so much, we don't like to change. In fact, I'm I'm what I consider middle age, and the reality is the older I get, the less I like change. More I want things to be very much the same and so on. But what I have to realize is, is that oftentimes, oftentimes it's the place of risk that brings the greatest potential of reward. And I think that's what Jesus was teaching them by saying, listen, I want you to go to that place that's uncomfortable. I want you to go to that place that that is, is a place you don't want to be, and I want to show up there. And sometimes we have to ask the question, what is risk to us? Is it taking a coworker out for lunch and to dive into their life a little bit and see where they are spiritually? Is perhaps risk giving a little bit more? Is, is risk serving a little bit more? And maybe serving in a particular area that's uncomfortable to you. You know, here's one of the things. I'm just going to throw this out. I hear people say this all the time. You know, I would love to, but that's not really my thing. And what, what that really says is I would love to help, but it's outside my comfort zone. And maybe Jesus is calling you out of your comfort zone. I learned something a few years ago. About five years ago or so, uh, my wife and I went to a conference. Actually, I went to a conference and she went shopping. That's how that usually works. So um, I went to a conference in in Las Vegas, Nevada, and actually went to a church um, conference of a church that was started on the Las Vegas Strip. I mean, if you're going to go to a place where people are really far from God, just go to the Las Vegas Strip and start a church. And that's what the guy did. So we went to Vegas um, and, and so on. And one of the things she wanted to do while we were there is to do the high roller. Anybody know what the high roller is? It's the big Ferris wheel. It it, it takes 30 minutes from the time you you start here and go all the way around. It takes 30 
minutes to go all the way around, and at night you get to see Vegas, and it's pretty and beautiful and so on like that, I think. But here's the problem. I, I love my wife, but I hate heights. I loathe them. I, I didn't always used to be. I used to climb trees, and uh, I had no problem doing that, but something happened along the way. I don't like heights anymore. So I, I can remember very, very vividly that they have seats there, but you can actually look at the panoramic view, and evidently it's, it, it's pretty and so on. But they have seats, and I sat on the seat for 30 minutes in a cold sweat, praying I wasn't going to die. <laughs> and you think I'm kidding with that? I remember there's an African-American lady looked at my wife and goes, is he going to be okay? <laughs> I mean, it was, it was like I was about to die sort of thing. Well, a few years after that, my family went to, um, we were going to Disneyland. Uh, We have an affinity for Disney. And um, on our way, we decided, let's stop the Grand Canyon. And so we went to the Grand Canyon, and Grand Canyon and guys like me don't mix. And so Tara and, and our middle son, Joel, that, uh, and we had our younger son, Seth. There was four of us. Uh, Joel is the one up, uh, up here leading worship here a few mo- moments ago. But um, Tara and Joel, jo- just immediately, I mean, they, they dart to, to the rail and, and so on like that. And they're like, great, great. Well, Seth, our, our youngest son, and myself, we're like about 15, 20 feet back, kind of going, you know, kind of looking over, but not really looking over because neither one of us like heights. And, and so I decided, you know what, I'm going to do it. I, I, and it probably took me 15 minutes of tiny little baby steps. Eventually, I got to that point where I'm looking over, and man, I'm a little queasy and so on like that. But it, eventually, I, I'm just able to focus in on the grandeur of God's creation. And in fact, there's, there's a preacher in Dallas, his name is Matt Chandler. He says, no one ever goes to the Grand Canyon and leaves talking about how great they are. But I remember thinking, and I have sense a lot since then, there was a big risk for me to do what I did because it was conquering a fear. But the reward of being able to just be there at that moment, at that place, was very much worth it. And sometimes we have to really consider the fact that God is calling us out of our comfort zones to a place of risk. And maybe he's going to show up in the risk. There's not a guarantee, but maybe. In fact, uh, I I read this many years ago, attempt something so great for God that if he's not in it, it's doomed for failure. And sometimes we, we as Christians need to realize that God's calling me out but if he's in this, there's something big that's going to happen. And so it might be, I, I, I'm going to take, I'm, I'm going to work with kids in the church, and while that's not my thing, maybe God is calling me to that, or maybe God's going to do something big when I trust Him in my giving, or God's going to do something big if I trust Him with my time. I think time is a, is a is a precious commodity in our culture and our society today. But here is the reality, and this is what I want to really kind of nail in. I've been here. I've been here since 2001, and, and, and when I look back at that, it was kind of risky for us to move here because we didn't know anybody, and, and it was kind of risky for a church to hire a guy like me that he's young and he's wet behind the ears and didn't have a whole lot of experience in ministry, but one of the things I've learned along the way is that sometimes God is calling us to discomfort. In fact, I'll, I'll, I'll just give you a couple of things that happened within really the first couple of years of me being here. Number one, we had a group of people that wanted the church to go in a, in a really a, a direction that would have not just, I think, been harmful to the church. It would have been um, kind of thumbing their nose at culture and saying, we don't really care about where you are or bringing you to Jesus. And the elders and I, uh, we had a meeting. We talked about it. We said, what are we going to do? And we said, no, we're going to go this direction. And the next thing from this group of people was actually a letter. And this letter was, are you willing to sacrifice your faithful giving members of your church for people outside the church? So the question was, lost or faithful members? And I remember looking at the elders. I haven't bought a house yet, thinking, I'm glad I haven't bought a house yet. And I said, so what is it going to be? Is it going to be the lost or faithful members? And I went around the room and said, lost, lost, lost. And so that was the decision that was made. And actually, a couple years after that, I asked our, 
uh, one of our elders who was, uh, was director of finances at the time, I said, so what would have happened if all those people would have left all at the same time? They eventually just trickled out, but what would have happened if they all would have left at the same time? He goes, about a third of our giving would have gone away. But the reality is, when we were running 100 people, they decided we're going to take this risk right here because it's the best one. And some of you who have been here for a long time, maybe been in Edgewood for a long time, know that there used to be a car show here at the church. Remember the car show? Um, and that would, that would draw a lot of people. In fact, that was a risky thing for us to do is to, while we're having church, having a car show and different things like that. And it was a kind of a big deal. And, and there was actually people that left our church during that time because they said, we are being too relevant. But then it reached a point. It reached a point where the ministry had kind of been drained out of that event. And now they have it down at Walmart every year, and they're doing ministry and different things like that. But the reality is we kind of reached the point to say, uh, it, it's, it's not having the ministry focus that it used to, so we killed it. We said, we're not going to do it anymore. And people called us nuts. But one of the things that we've been able to do is focus in on, on care ministries and outreach ministries to the less fortunate because we freed up our, our time and resources to other areas. So sometimes I could, I could look back and I could tell you time and time and time again of risk but great reward. We took a risk this fall. We added another service. Adding another service has probably not been the easiest thing for us to do. And it's not growing by leaps and bounds, but the reality is there's been probably three or four Sundays over the last two months that had it not been for that service, we would not have been able to facilitate the number of people that were in this room. It's, just, it's all there is to it. I mean, that is one of those things. So the risk paid off. We're actually, um, and, and, and they're not going to hear this today because they've already heard this sermon uh, a, a few months ago, and I'm, I'm recycling it today, by the way. <laughs> but they heard me preach on this, and, and one of the things I talked to them about is risk. But there's a certain element of risk of, of us partnering with another church. There's a certain amount of risk of, of time and, and different things like that away from, uh, uh, away from here to put into efforts there to watch the kingdom grow in the state of New Mexico. And I want to tell you that when we started with Gallup, they were having about 10 or 12 people a Sunday. And when we would bring four or five people out from Valley View Christian Church, they were like, yay, this is great. Well, I'm going to tell you right now, um, they're running about 30 a Sunday now over the last three months. And, and I, I look at that and say our, our risk has, has really paid off. And so with that, we understand that God sometimes is calling us to a place of discomfort. In fact, let me just say it like this. Let me find that here in my notes. Uh, Jesus wants Christians and he wants churches um, who are willing uh, to, to be uncomfortable and take risks for him. That we're willing to, to do what most people would consider abnormal and we wonder if God's going to show up, and I think God's going to show up. And one of the things I want to encourage you to do is understand that God may be calling you to a place of discomfort. He might be playing, uh, calling you to a place of risk. Just trust Him in that risk. And in fact, one of the things that's so beautiful here is I know the end of the story. And, and part of the end of the story is when, when Peter saw that what Jesus had done and they put him into, Jesus put him into a risky situation, and there was great reward. Peter said, you know what? Hey, you're too holy. You're too good. I need you to get away from me. That's, it was his request. His Lord, you got to go. But Jesus said, do not be afraid. From now on, you're going to catch men. Now, do you know the number one command in the Bible? Is don't be afraid. It's to fear not. And so when we're in a place of fear, that's a place for God to show up. But here's the beautiful thing, and I want to read verse 11 here today. And verse 11 says this, And when they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. A lot of times what we do is you know, we have to understand that this was, this was the biggest payday of their life. This was the, I'm getting a bonus, business is good, honey, we're going to Hawaii sort of day. But it says that they immediately left everything and followed him. And, and I think this is one of the things that, that we need to do is we don't just need to identify who we follow. We say we follow Jesus. 
I think sometimes we have to nail it down. What is it that we need to leave behind? What is it that we need to leave behind? Because when we follow, that implies that we leave. In and, and, and fact, they left, it says, everything. So as we close out here today, I want to show you a video, and then John's going to come lead us to communion. But as we do that here today, I want you to consider what is it that I need to be leaving behind in order to truly follow Jesus into the discomfort and risk of life.